Well, good morning. Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to get keen, so I'm hoping you'll get keen today as well. Great to see so many along this morning at our morning service and, and those joining us online. We pray that the Lord has a special blessing for you today as uh, we worship the Lord today. So first thing we'll do is we'll stand up and uh, sing number, uh, song number one, hymn number one in your, in your book, O Worship the King. Great singing. Great. We'll just open in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you this morning, Lord, we we do give you thanks for this day. We're thankful, Lord, that we can come to this place today, open your word and sing praises unto you. We just ask, Lord, that you would just remove the troubles and the thoughts of the week that's gone by. We ask, Lord, that uh, we will be focused on you. We do pray for Pastor Brenton, Lord, as he delivers the message to us this morning. We just ask, Lord, that you would just bless him, bless Olga. Lord, we're thankful for their willingness to come and share the gospel with us. And we just pray, Lord, that we might receive a special blessing from him. We just thank you for this time, Lord, and we just ask that you would just bless us, encourage us this day. For these things we just ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Set it. Okay. Once again, welcome along to those um, here and online. Um, we, a special welcome to Pastor Brent and Olga. Appreciate uh, your time today and it's great to have you finally back and ministering with us here today after a few months away. Um, so Pastor Brent and as we said we'll be opening up God's word this morning and next week as well and there'll be a fellowship morning tea after each service um, for this week and next so join with us and uh, have some fellowship and uh, I think which has been sadly missing for the last few months so it'll be a nice time just to fellowship and catch up with each other um, Pastor Brent and Olga will be visiting many of the brethren over the next few two weekends if you'd like to catch up with them um, see Bryce and he'll arrange that um, get those arrangements in place. So the other ministries this week, um, Joy Club will be held this week at Rose City um, Gardens Park again this week, a Tuesday at five o'clock. Prayer meeting Thursday night at 7.30. If you want to get us people along to that on a Thursday night, it'd be great to see people along to that on a Thursday night and pray. 
Uh, pray also for the mothers group, which is now meeting regularly, uh, which is great to see. Reminder that there's also an online broadcast for um, children's Bible lessons um, from Hannah and David Young um, on our church website. So go to the church website, click on the link, and uh, if you want to see, uh, have some children's Bible lessons. Um, so this Friday the 12th at 6.30, there'll be a barbecue evening for the youth and young adults at the Rose City Gardens. It's a great opportunity for young people to get together and also invite a friend along as well. Pastor Brenton will be given the devotion. Um, David and Hannah will send out an update on the messaging service for young people this week. Please also continue to pray. Um, there's been a lot of talk about this um, pandemic bill that the Andrews government is trying to push through Parliament. Uh, we're asking people to pray about that, um, to email and petition the crossbenchers. I don't know whether email and, and petitions work, but certainly the power of prayer works. We need to be praying about that. Um, it's not good, it's wicked, and we need to pray against it, and we need to see some change there. So those, um, that bill will be discussed apparently in Parliament on the 16th and the 18th of November, so really need to be in prayer for that, and yeah, hopefully the, it'll be overturned. So this time I'll just ask the gentlemen if they want to come forward and take up the offerings. Uh, the Bible reading now asks Brother Jack if he wants to come and share the reading with us today from Acts chapter 6, verses 8 to 15. Acts chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 8 to 15. And it says, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue which is called the synagogue of uh, the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them uh, Cilicia and of, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him, blaspheme, heard him speak blas blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up a false witness which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against his holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And that's the word of God. Thanks, Jack. Okay, you open the hymn books again to hymn number 49, and uh, we'll stand to sing this, and then we'll ask Pastor Brenton to come and share the word with us. So hymn number 49.
The, t the challenge is not the message, the challenge is unwrapping the paper. <laughs> and apparently there's going to be a test at the end, so make sure you listen. We always have trials. Trials and tribulations. Trials and tribulations. <laughs> well, thanks for putting up with me doing all of that. Come on to green. Roger, you've been such a help in putting up with me. Could you do that? It's hard. Could you give out those Bible verses to some people that can read for me? We've had a good couple of days. We've been, yesterday we were up Mount Samaria way and uh, we enjoyed that. Um, but up in Mount Samaria, there's a large area of forest and I believe there'd be some birds up there and the, probably the superb lyre bird. Has anybody seen them up there? I hope someone has. Does anybody know what sort of a noise the superb lyre bird makes? Come on, someone take a guess. Anybody, take a guess. Pardon? Yes, you're exactly right. Whatever you said was right. <laughs> anybody else? The reason why you're right is the superb lyre bird is known because it has a very distinctive call. Ugh, I'm getting better and better today. It has a distinctive call and I really don't know what it is but I do know that they mimic so if they could hear Roger up the back on his earth moving they'd be trying to mimic that or someone on a chainsaw or Josh or one of the children calling they I'm told they even mimic school bells so the um, the lyre birds like that but I don't want to talk about that bird I want to talk about a bird that's got a distinctive call and part of it is because it's concerned over its territory. Let's just see what colour I'll use here. So it wants to mark out its territory. It also is a bird that's, I never knew it, but it loves its family because in fact the little baby birds, they off without any feathers and uh, most birds do I know but in their family um, the baby the babies but they stay home four or five years so you can have up to 12 birds in a nest or wherever they make their home so I suppose I should give you a bit of a clue what the birds like Can you imagine staying home and then looking at all these birds looking after their brothers and sisters and feeding them and looking after them all of this time? So they're born blind, but it takes about four or five weeks before they start to develop all their feathers and so forth. But they're a well-known bird. I've done a bad job there already. Ah, oh, well. We'll keep going, we'll keep going. Hardly sitting on any trip branch there at all, is it? It's a bird that's usually its upper beak is darker than its lower beak. So this one, it does have a beak here. Any thoughts what sort of bird it's going to be? Oh, I know. <laughs> it doesn't look anything like the picture. Yes, that young man back here. I'm not going to say for a minute, all right? But it does have a distinctive call, and kookaburras are like that. Where does this tree live? <laughs> Where does the bird live? 
They often live in hollows in trees. They live in the sides of riverbanks. They sometimes live in termite mounds. So they're well known for their family. They're, they have a particularly good home, home life. They live in river banks. You're, you know, you're absolutely right, it is a kookaburra. Because what do they eat? Does anybody know what kookaburras eat? Some will say goldfish. And they do. Sausages if they could get them. <laughs> Oh, I know, look, I've really messed my bird up. But that, that sometimes happens. They're related to the um, kingfisher and there's a bit of blue sometimes in them. Not always. But I'm allowed to put some blue in it. So they have a home, as I said, termite mounds, river banks. What do they eat for food? I've already mentioned yabbies. Termites, of course, bugs, insects, anything that they can get to. I know I'm not very good at this, but there's one thing about it. I enjoy it. Even if you've got to put up, the school teachers can put me right a little bit later. What's something else kookaburras like to eat? Snakes. Who said that? Someone said it back here. Snakes. Ah, it's not a very good snake. And that, you're looking at that one upside down because it's obviously it's a red-bellied black snake. You can see that. <laughs> It is a kookaburra, of course, and they're very distinctive. It's not like a lyre bird. Did you know that Christ also puts out a distinctive call? And I'm going to ask, we've got some Bible readings there. Um, have you got them all, have you, Roger? Matthew 9, 13. Who's got that for me, please? Yes, please. Thank you. There's a call to salvation calling sinners, people that are lost, people that are filled with anguish and, and uh, separation from God to salvation, to peace with God. Christ gives a call to salvation and it's open to every one of us. That's really good. What about Matthew 4.19, please? There's a call for each of us to serve in some way. And of course we're all made different, we'll all serve in different ways. What about 2 Peter 5, 7? Um, oh, that'll do, that'll do better. <laughs> it's a long way down with my glasses on, brother, I couldn't see it properly. Yeah. There's a call for comfort. Cast all your care upon him. For he careth for you. Do you feel heavy laden? Do you feel like politics and everything else to get you down? Christ says, cast your cares on him because he cares for you. There's also another call and that's in John 10, 27.
there's a call to follow. There's a call to follow. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a call to follow him. Know his voice to follow him. Matthew 28, please. Amen. So there's a command, there's a distinctive call to tell others, to go out and talk about it. You know, God's real. There's an opportunity for us to talk about him. And 1 Thessalonians 4, please. I'm getting squiggly at the bottom there. I'm going to say that's a call to a marriage. Can you still see me or I'm probably standing in your way over there. It's a call to a marriage. It's a, um, there's a trumpet call. There's a call and he calls us up to be with him. But why does he do that? Because he wants to give us a new body. He wants us to enjoy a marriage supper, a marriage between the groom and the bride. And so the, the, the distinctive call of Christ includes a call for a rapture to be called up to be with him. I feel pretty pathetic with my drawing, but you know what? I still enjoy it. Now, does anybody know what sort of sound the lyre bird makes? Can anybody make the sound of a kookaburra? Yes, that man there. That's it. That's it. That's it particularly well too. Uh, when you get older, you get used to people laughing at you. So that all works out. That's supposed to have been an eye there. And they do have a lighter spot behind it. And the feathers come out and around. The tail feathers can go up. I think that's one of the worst kookaburras I've drawn. (laughs) But I don't really mind because they're a fascinating animal and they do put out a distinctive call and it reminds us that Christ puts out a distinctive call to salvation, to serve, to he comforts us, to comfort us, to tell others, to a marriage and to a rapture. And now the gentleman back here knows why I brought the rag with me. <laughs> I walked in with my hands full. Well, if you've got your Bibles with you, please turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Chapter 4. And look, I just want to thank you for the opportunity of being able to come, come back again. And it's always a wonderful opportunity to to speak, to open God's word up and uh, to have your people here. One Thessalonians chapter four. But before I go into that, some would well remember back in 1995 to 2007 there was a Left Behind series and there were some books that were the best sellers Um, they made it there were six um, but Christians and non-Christians were reading these a series of books about being left behind seven of them were best sellers in the New York Times bestseller list so they made a big impact on the world bestsellers on the New York Times bestsellers. But what those books did, it had done something that hadn't happened before. 
It got people from the church thinking about the return of the Lord with a rapture and the ordinary people thinking the same things. They were thinking, is God going to do a work? Is he going to take his people out? Um, about the same time, there was a book called The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey came out and some would remember The Thief in the Night. That sort of just came before and it helped raise awareness. I can see some of you remember that. But as this idea that, yes, there's a rapture, yes, God's going to step in in a moment of time like he did with the Noah's flood, the world looked at it and they laughed. Um, there's record of the one sitcom on the NBC called 30 Rock. It was always making fun that Christians would believe there's going to come a time when they're going to be snatched up to be with the Lord. And their main character... Um, supposedly believed in a rapture and he started to set dates and so one day he walked around with a date on his t-shirt and said when the rapture was going to be and of course you know it never happened and everybody laughed their heads. Our situation has not helped because we have many cults and groups today that have set the dates and then they reset the dates when the Lord will return and of course no one knows the actual date when the Lord will return. So people are put off by sometimes by people saying the Lord is going to return or this or that is going to happen. In 2016, Lifeway Research did a telephone survey of 1,000 Protestant senior pastors. This is in America and only one third believed in the literal rapture of the church. It's probably less today. But we would wonder what's happening today because a lot of people are saying, what is happening in this world? Why is it? And especially you can feel it here in Victoria. I know we've lived interstate. And it's not as intense as here in Victoria. The world is changing. We can see things that are changing rapidly around us. And um, Christians and non-Christians agree with that. They say, has the world changed forever? We wonder, what's going to happen? The Bible tells us what is going to happen. China especially for us is both fascinating and scary at the moment. They've put a lot of cameras all through their cities. They've got facial recognition. They're tracking where people go and what they're doing. And of course we've got that now already with our telephones and so forth. We've got tracking more than ever before. China have put in a merit system. So if you're a good communist uh, party person, if you're supporting the government, you get the benefits. But if you're a Christian, if you're someone that believes in God and you're saying, oh, I want to, to hold to this, then there's um, penalties. Your children may not be able to go to school or university. You may not be able to go on to the public transport system. You won't get the job, or if you do, it'll be the lowest sort of jobs. We're starting to see that happen in a lot of ways in our society today. There's distinguishing ways of, of penalising people. Christians in China are penalised especially by not being able to get work. Their children not being able to get the right schooling. As I said, the survey of pastors showed um, that pastors, well, especially those under 45, were less likely to believe in a pre-trip rapture and more likely to believe that this calling up of the saints is going to happen the very time when Christ returns. In 2014... The Left Behind movie was remade with a fellow called Nicolas Cage as the main actor. Now, I saw it a few weeks back with our grandchildren. My wife said, let's see something, if we can, from the Christian TV, and we saw that. Oh, there's some good things about it. There's some that I wouldn't say are quite so accurate. It's probably almost taken from a, a, a non-Christian's point of view because one of the things they didn't do was open up the Scriptures and say, why well, they held. But I've got to make a confession. It really... It, sobered me up, it made me stop and think because how often do we think about the future? You know, if I was to say to you the rapture's going to happen this afternoon, you'd laugh at me and say, oh, it's never going to happen this afternoon. But the Bible says he's going to come at a time when you're not expecting him. And if you don't expect him to come this afternoon, it may well be. So the Bible would have us always to be ready and watching. There's a where to be ready, where to be watching and looking for him 
to return. And as I said, it to sort of really shook me up a little bit just to, to see it. Some say, oh, look, there's nothing we can see in the Bible to even to support a rapture. There's especially nothing in the Old Testament to support the saints being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. But then they forget that the church age was a mystery to those... Um, sorry, the, the, yeah, the church age was a mystery to those... I'm saying it around the wrong way, aren't I? Yeah, the, the, all that was happening, the church age was a mystery to the Old Testament say, saints. But we do see Enoch. He was walking with God and God took him. We see a sense of Elijah. He was snatched up to heaven in a fiery chariot. They ignore the beautiful picture of a Jewish marriage with the, the bride waiting for the groom to return and to, to, to take her to the marriage feast. They ignore the type of the Feast of Trumpets. So back in between 1995 and 2007, there's been a swing away. A lot of people don't, don't hold to the rapture generally. So we've got to say, what do we believe? What do we believe and can we see it in the scriptures? What will Christ do? He's already died for his bride, the church. Is he going to do something special with it? Is he going to call her up to be with himself? We've also, sometimes we need to stop and consider, we won't be here for the tribulation period, but it will be one of intense grief and horror, and it's soon to come. We're not to underestimate God's plan. Noah warned that there was um, judgment to come. Enoch, we see, warned. And the people disregarded it. And so we have the scripture that would warn us of what's to come now. We're in the book of 1 Thessalonians. Thanks for bearing with me thus far. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 13. Paul wants to answer a question. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, and, and that's us, folks, shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel and with a trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up alive together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. And then he says in verse 18, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. They are words of comfort that this God has a plan and a program and it's going to come about. It is going to happen as he's set out. We've just read, let's pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We can come around your word. I thank you for these people. Patience with me with my picture. Thank you, Lord. We can delight that you are a great God, that you have a plan, a program, that things are happening on your schedule. We feel that the world is rushing out of control sometimes, but we need to be brought up and say, no, there is a plan and God is in control. Lord, as has been done, we would be praying for leaders in this country and leaders in the state of Victoria. We would be praying for a righteousness, righteousness that exalts a nation. We'd be praying for righteous decisions. We're praying for bills that come before the parliament, Lord, that are ungodly or that are out of balance and give power too much to one man, Lord, that that would be defeated. We pray for your hand in this matter to have mercy upon us. Lord, I thank you for these people. I ask that you would give them Holy Spirit understanding of all that is said and for the speaker for clarity of speech. So we thank you and praise you. Amen. Paul's answering a question here. He wants to give them an answer. He's saying there's a resurrection to this new body. We're going to be snatched up to be with the Lord. But those that are already dead, they're not going to miss out. They're going to be caught up to be with the Lord at the same time. But just to sort of make it easy, he says, well, naturally, they're going to beat us. Now, we won't go into any of the jokes concerning, you know, who gets called up first out of the denominations and things like that. And there's a few of those around the place. But Paul says, 
immediately at the same time with them and behind them almost are dead and Christ rise first because he wants to bring them together as a body. He wants to bring them together as this bride so that all the ages and can be brought together. And not just at the moment there, those that are dead already with, with Christ in spirit and they're knowing what they are, but there wants to come a time for a marriage supper, they need a body. We've had some lovely suppers while we've been here and I'm glad I've got a body to enjoy it. And this is a reality of what's going to happen with us. We need a marriage supper, to a, a, a present, a, a, just a time of being with the Lord. It's, it's like a wedding reception as such. Verse 6, 16 says, The Lord descends from heaven with a shout or a cry of excitement. And it's got the idea of a military command. It's like, let's go! That's the sort of command that it is. And there's a voice of the archangel and a trumpet call. And from there we go to meet the Lord in the air. We're called up to meet him. And Christ has returned for his church. He's returned for his bride at last. Because he's prepared a place for you and I. And this is different to his second coming when he'll return with all of the saints to rule on earth during the millennial kingdom after the marriage supper of the Lamb. And this is all going to happen, the Bible says, without any, or going to happen suddenly without any prophetic signs or warnings. We could say that the rapture is imminent. Now we can look at what's going to happen in the tribulation and the build up to that, and we can see it happening around us now. You can see there are signs. But there's nothing that needs to be fulfilled for the rapture to occur. There are many things that need to be fulfilled before the second coming of Christ, including the Antichrist to set up an image in this, the temple that will be built in Jerusalem and worshipped at that time. Daniel refers to this as well as Christ in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse. Before the coming, second coming of Christ, Christ, literally to come back to earth to set up his kingdom, there will be signs. And one of those will be the Antichrist setting up an image in the temple in Jerusalem. Prior to the idea, prior to the time of the rapture, or this snatching up of the saints to meet the Lord in the air, the dead in Christ are with Christ. They're in a spirit, they're a, a spirit form as such. They're, they're conscious, they're thinking, they identify things. But in God's plan, they need a body. Now, I've spoken with people in hospital over the years and some think, oh, heaven's going to be lovely. We'll be floating around like spirits, you know, and sitting on clouds. And... But God's plan is that we will have a, a physical body. Now, it won't be the same body, thank goodness. It's going to be a resurrected body. But he's got a plan for each of us to have a new body, something that is not held down by age and, and uh, a few aches like and pains. This new body is important. Paul talks about it through many of his letters. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. He's saying our conversation, our citizenship, we belong in heaven, folks. You and I are children of the king and one day we're going to go be with him. That's actually where we belong. And when we go to belong there, we'll need a new body, a new um, sense of who we are. We're the same person, but we're changed. The Apostle John, 132. Beloved, now are we the sons of God and doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. We're going to be taken for our citizenship in heaven. This is our future. So Paul's going to say, folks, we need a resurrected body. We need this change in our body. We can't be the bride pure and spotless and ready to go be with him and have a wonderful fellowship with him the way we are. Because I don't know about you, but I'm still a sinful person. I still get wrong thoughts and I still battle with things. We need to be changed to be a perfectly enjoy God. Does that make sense? I hope it does. It does. 
Turn across, or back, I should say, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm trying to move along. Please bear with me. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. 1 Corinthians 15, 49, because he's going to talk about our bodies and those that are dead and as being corruptible and corrupting and our, those that are alive here as being mortal, waiting to put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Wonderful verses, aren't they? Our corruptible sin natures will be instantly transformed. It'll be, the sin aspect will be eradicated. We'll experience perfection in body and soul and spirit. And this is all going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. What a wonderful promise. Now look, we all know people that have, have trouble maybe with arthritis or they've got a broken leg or maybe they've got eyesight problems or hearing. We all know people that have had troubles of one sort or another. That's going to end. We're not going to have that in heaven. Look, some people might say, oh, how is it important? Is it to have a new body? Well, you ask someone that's blind or you ask someone that's got arthritis or a crippling back injury or migraine headaches. You ask them. It's really important. It's really going to be wonderful to be free of that, to go to a marriage supper with the Lamb, to be the bride of Christ. Don't say it, this won't affect you. Don't say, well, this is not really that important because it is important when you get a, a look further ahead in this life. This will affect each one of us that are here. Paul says, it's a mystery. Verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. But he's saying there's going to be a coming generation that will not die or sleep, that are going to be changed in an instant. Verse 51, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It's going to happen in the twinkling of an eye. And this snatching up is necessary for the church age saints to become a beautiful corporate body, to be put all together. So you'll be able to perhaps mingle with some of the other saints of the, through, down through the ages. You know, John Wycliffe or Tyndale or Huss or whoever some of your heroes were or um, Eliot or we can just go back in time. Uh, or the Apostle Paul or John or any of those. There was a day when one of John the Baptist's disciples came to, to John and said, look, the Jesus, Jesus is baptising more people than we are. And John the Baptist would say to them, I'm just a friend of the, of the groom. He has to increase and I'm going to decrease. We want the groom who's going to have the bride to get all the glory. John understood this beautiful picture of, of the groom that's come to draw up as people to himself. And that picture of the Christ and his bride keeps popping up through scripture. Paul told the Corinthians he had a, a godly jealousy over them. He wanted them to come and be, be presented before God pure and chaste. He wanted to present the Corinthian church as a, as a wonderful church. And, and we would be saying, may our churches in Australia be the same, be seen as, as godly churches, churches with a heart for him, a heart to keep things um, scriptural. He was jealous. Paul was jealous over the Corinthians and he viewed them as a bride of Christ. Ephesians 5, we use it in weddings often. It talks about 
uh, the picture that um, um, the man follows the example of Christ in leading, and the woman is a picture is and follows the church, or maybe the church, whichever way it goes. Anyway, the woman's related to the to the church, and the husband is related to Christ as the provider and the protector. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Oh, that's exciting to me. I sort of can't always wrap my head around being called a woman, but the idea that we're going to be righteous, we're going to be in white clothing and and that's a wonderful thought. When you, as you get older, you realise to have the righteousness of Christ, to be, to be dressed in his robes of righteousness is a wonderful thing. Because if we had to do it ourselves, we'd be in trouble. You could never live good enough. You could never live clean enough. Christ gives it to us. If we can grasp some of what happens in a Jewish wedding... In a marriage, we can see some of the wonder of the rapture. Jewish marriage included a number of steps. First, there was a betrothal, which involved the, the prospective groom would leave his home and he'd travel from his father's house to the home of the prospective bride and he'd pay the purchase price and they would establish a marriage covenant. Christ left his father's home. He came to earth. He paid the price for us in his own blood. And he bought us when he died on the cross for us. Secondly, the groom would then, after he's paid the purchase price, he has to go home to his father's house, which means remaining separate from his bride. So he's got to go back and spend time at his father's house. Now, the father, if you go to Israel today, you see the properties. And, of course, the father owns the land and he in the son inherits it and he, and he gets parts of the land. And so... The father goes to build a home, sorry, the son goes back to build a home on that property. And the picture there is of a, the father has a mansion and, and the son builds an adjoining apartment uh, on the, the, the father's property. But the fascinating thing is, is that the son, <laughs> a lot of sons are like this too, he, he probably runs up and says, Dad, have I done a good job? <clears throat> Can I go get my wife now? He says, no, son, you've still got to paint the nursery. You know, and then he runs off and he, and he does all, all of these things. Dad, can I go get my bride yet? And the father goes back and he looks at the place and he says, is it, is it suitable for a bride? And when the father says, OK, then the young man can go to get his bride. Now, there's a beautiful truth in this. The Jehovah Witnesses would say, ah, oh, the Lord Jesus is not God. If he was God, he would know when he was coming back. The Lord Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour, not even himself. Not even himself. So the Jehovah Witnesses, therefore he can't be equal with God. But what Christ is doing is he's simply saying, I'm following this picture of a Jewish marriage. And when my heavenly father gives me the okay, then it's time to return. So perhaps he's waiting on fixing up a mansion for some of you people here. I don't know. But when it's ready, when the time is fulfilled, and the scriptures talks about the time of the Gentiles being fulfilled, he will return for us. So there's a beautiful picture, and the rapture is required for that. Matthew, sorry, Mark 13, 32. But of that day and at that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. And when the man did return, he would turn to be singing and dancing. But as he came, there'd be a shout. And the bride, the bride was probably, what's that noise? And yes, he could hear him coming. There'd be a shout and then he'd, he'd appear very soon after that. And so we're called to be ready. We're waiting for a shout we won't have time to change anything because it'll happen so quickly. But there'll be that shout first of all. His coming will be in the twinkling, a twinkling of an eye. I think I said a twinkling. And then fourthly, he will return, this Jewish man will return to the groom's 
father's house to consummate the marriage and to celebrate the wedding feast for the next seven days. So they go back and they're, they're locked up and used in the Jewish uh, perspective, she remains in her bridal chamber for the next seven days. And perhaps this aligns with the seven years of tribulation on earth from which the bride is protected from. So if we use the Jewish picture, <clears throat> then there's got to be a rapture. There's got to be a time when God will send his son down to snatch us up to be with him. <clears throat> We've seen in 1 Thessalonians, though, that the believers meet Christ in the air. At Christ's second coming, when he comes to set up his kingdom, there's no meeting. Zechariah 14 tells us that all the nations are raging against Jerusalem and Christ returns and sets up his feet on the Mount of Olives. If we're alive at the time of the rapture, we're going up. Hallelujah. We're going up. And those left behind will be perplexed. They'll be saying, what's happening here? And folks, I should just, as a, as a, a sideline, the devil knows this. Have you ever seen any of the movies where we're seeing people disappear and the devil has got reasons for it? Maybe it's aliens zooming them up or whatever else it might be. You know, we're seeing precursors of it because the devil likes to get in with his thoughts. At the second coming, the entire world will know that he's coming and they'll see him coming. Matthew 24, 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's Christ's words in Matthew 24. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. So those two things are very different. I know this might be hard to grasp for some of the, the little ones. I'm sorry for that. But we're going to be taken up. And the Bible says this is a comfort. That God has got a plan for you and a plan for your life and you're going to be taken up to be with him, to be his bride and then to, in, to go on into the millennium. The rapture could happen at any moment. The second coming, before that comes, there'll be the Antichrist will be set up his image in the temple. Oh, some will say, but Christians have always suffered tribulation down through the years. Why should he take his church out? Why shouldn't they suffer through this tribulation period? Why should they be any different? But Christ's plan is to gather us all together. And he doesn't see us as being sinful and needing any purging. He wants to gather us all together to be with him for this special occasion. 2 Corinthians 5. For he made him sin to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he's going to call this group of people up in righteousness to be with him. After snatching of the bride, Israel takes the centre stage. She's prepared for the tribulation, for the reign of Christ to follow. We don't deserve that. We're blood-bought, we're taken out, and Israel is then the centre of the tribulation. We're living in an age of grace. Christ said that he will build his church, and his church will be built. God's program will continue through the tribulation and then on to 1,000 year reign of Christ. Folks, we've got a lot to look forward to. We've got a lot to be thankful for. And part of it is, I wouldn't have designed it like this, this idea that we're going to be caught up to be with him. If that happened, are you ready? And if I said at the beginning, if you knew it would happen this afternoon, would you be ready? Is there someone you need to speak to? Because he said he's going to come and you're not expecting it. Let me read again the words of Paul to the Thessalonians because he's going to finish with, this is an encouragement. But I want to just, before I do that, ask the question, are you excited that when this happens that in fact we will see Christ face to face and we'll be with him? This is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And the plan of all the saints of all the ages coming together. 1 Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So Paul understood this teaching to be a comfort, and so should we. And we're living at a time when there's, a, there's turmoil and uncertainty around us, but folks, God is still on the throne. He's in control. We have a sure hope. May we comfort each other. May we comfort each other. These promises are a comfort. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the patience of these people. Lord, I thank you we can come around your word. Sometimes it's hard to grasp, but Lord, we just look to you. You're a great God, a wondrous God. Lord, there's a great joy that things are going according to your plan. And it is true that doesn't negate that we're to be salt and light until the time you call us up. And, and at this time, the Victorian Parliament certainly needs salt and light and needs people to stand up, people to be praying, people to be writing letters and uh, doing what they can as citizens. So, Lord, I thank you. I pray your blessings also upon this church and her contact of people extending it. Lord, we think of various missionaries at this time, Lord, I'd also remember Rob Boy and pray your hand to be upon him and his uh, getting certain details fixed up. Lord, we think of other missionaries. We um, will just bring them also before you. But thank you, Lord God. We pray for our sister churches across this land. We thank you, we praise you, and we love you. Amen. Thanks, Pastor. I have an image in my mind of um, watching a YouTube video once and the pastor standing there preaching and holding his Bible up and bang, and the rapture happened. And every time I hear a sermon on the rapture, I think about that and think, and they show two or three sitting in the church. And I think, I don't want to be amongst that two or three sitting in the church. A really timely message, and we thank you for that today. A blessing. So we'll just stand to sing the final hymn 270. And then we'll...
Just close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your encouragement. And we thank you, Lord, that one day soon we may be raptured to be with you. But Lord, we pray that we will be ready, we will be looking, and we will be waiting. Prepare our hearts, Lord, and encourage us to share the gospel with others this week, Lord, so that others may come to a saving knowledge of you. We just ask, Lord, you would just take us to our homes in safety and bring us back to the next appointed time. For these things we just ask in your precious name. Amen.